please welcome our guests today. <laughs> so, just to let you know, just to let you know very quickly, the Media Innovation Lab is one part of Hubert Burda Media, and um, we are in the Media Innovation Lab, or short iLab. We are developing and assessing new technologies, uh, new products, new business models, uh, and apply them to our more traditional publishing-related uh, businesses. And I'm very happy for that reason, because obviously mobile and apps is one of our core priorities for the uh, last months, and I would say one and a half years anyway, and I'm very happy to have great people here with me uh, in Munich from all around the world, who each of them realized um, outstanding and also very different um, mobile and app uh, products. And I would love uh, to start with introducing you, Michael, Michael Schneider, who founded Mobile uh, Roadie uh, some time uh, ago. And Michael, from what I understood, you don't look after content itself. You are trying to build a product that enables everybody not to build a new app from the scratch on, but really focus um, on the content and you are doing the rest. How is that working? What is your product looking like? Well, it's, uh, it's working quite well. Um, so yeah, we don't touch content. We are a system that lets non-techies make apps. Um, if you've used the DLD app, that's one we power along with about 2,000 others. And unless you're building a game or an Instagram or something very specialized and custom, there's really no reason anymore to, to make an app from scratch. Uh, it's reinventing the wheel, it's hard to maintain, it's hard to do a good job of, and uh, a lot of people get ripped off doing work they don't need to do. So we're trying to democratize the making of apps, make it simple and inexpensive, and putting power back into the hands of the brands uh, that are trying to make the apps. Like simply and inexpensive obviously uh, sounds very good for everybody maybe also sitting in the audience and thinking about an own app for their own product or uh, for their own uh, company. Can you describe um, where are the limits, what kind of uh, use cases do you cover and how is it working? What kind of skill set um, need people bring with you to, to come and build a new fancy app with your product? Well, if you can type an email, you can, you can make an app. Um, so that's the skill set. I think most of, you, most of you are probably qualified. Um, it, the limitation is, is sort of what I touched on. Um, if you want to do uh, uh, a 3D car racing game, then it's, it's not the right system. That needs to be done from scratch. Um, I think any, and it's obviously we're not the only people doing this, but I think any content-driven app should be done by a platform today, not from scratch, because it's just a waste of time and money. You mentioned earlier, very quickly, that you also realized this year's DLD apps for iPhone, for Android, and also for iPad. The iPad one is a very special one because it's your, can you call it prototype? So the first one you really publicly released? Yeah, uh, I hate using the word beta. Um, and if anyone had any problems with the iPad app, please tell me. I do want to know. Um, it is our very first public iPad app. Uh, we're very excited about it, and um, would you like me to... Um... Yeah, we, we talked about an experiment to even um, fill the very, very last seats that are still empty here. So since we have the possibility you having you, um, um, uh, you with us uh, and you having control over that app, um, we talked a little experiment, and uh, please go so ahead and tell what you're doing. Okay. No, take, take the microphone if, if you're okay with us. Oh, so you have yeah. the microphone there, fine. So could I just get my computer on the screen? So this is a live demo, so hopefully it works. Um, before I do it, how many people have an iPhone in the audience? <laughs> Did Apple sponsor this conference? Um, of the people that have iPhones, how many have the DLD app? OK. Uh, how good. about Android? Wow, OK. And how, you guys have, how many have the app that have an Android device? OK. And um, who has something other than an iPhone or, or Android? And how about an iPad? Blackberry. Blackberry? Still some left. OK. Um, all right. So um, the reason I want to do this demo is one of the questions I get asked every day is, what is the difference between a mobile-friendly website and an application? 
and do I need both, and do I need to build an app because mobile web is moving so fast and all that stuff. So one of the really important key differences is the ability to send out push notifications, send out proactive messages based on where the users are. You can't really do that with a website. You can send text messages. It doesn't really work the same way. So uh, I want to demonstrate this small part to you. So this is our system, and um, I'm going to go ahead and send a push notification. I'm going to send it now. Uh, this is the message that uh, I'm going to send about this panel right now. And here's the really cool part. Here's Google Maps. I'm going to draw a box around Munich. Now I'm going to zoom in, and here are all the people in the Munich area that actually have this app installed, and they're even color-coded based on how much you've come into the app, how active are you, how engaged are you. So if I want to, I can change my message based on that, but I'm just going to send it. Um, OK, so the 58 is a misleading number. Actually, the DLD app, I haven't even told DLD this yet, not only has been downloaded all over the world, but uh, I've been told there's 1,000 attendees, and we just passed uh, 1,020 downloads. So there's actually more people that have this app than are attending the conference. These are people that are in Munich that have shared their location uh, recently. So let's go ahead and hit send, and I'm praying there's a couple chimes in the audience. Anybody? One? Two? OK. So Everyone should share their location more. But anyway, this, this is one of the, um, the coolest features about apps, the ability to send a, a geo-targeted message in real time based on where the app users are. And it has implications for conferences, for sporting events, for publications, for really any business that want to reach people where they are in real time. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Going from your left to right, I, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Nick Deloisio. If I would have been in, in the UK, in London with you right now, I would have not even had to mention your name because you are a superstar there already and I'm, soon, uh, I'm sure you will be soon uh, in Europe and all over the world. You founded one, a, a company called Sumly, a product called Sumly, one year ago. Today you are 16 years old. Um, why did you not start earlier? <laughs> so, I mean, I've been doing iPhone programming for the last three years, ever since July 2008, uh, when the App Store was announced. And I guess it was this year that I got more serious with my applications. So prior to Sumly, and if anyone doesn't know what Sumly is, uh, Sumly allows you to browse the web in a concise and effective manner. We provide succinct summaries of search results, articles, and web pages, so you can instantaneously gauge and preview the content while browsing the web on a mobile device. And so I guess earlier this year, I would create an app called Facemood. And Facemood used a, a pretty basic sentiment analysis algorithm that I just created uh, in Objective-C. And Apple made it a star favorite, and that gave me the confidence to kind of explore natural language processing a little further, this field of obviously artificial intelligence. It's, it's really um, current at this moment in time. And so that led on to Sumly because I was revising for history exams at school. And I found I was using Google and Bing. And if you use Google and Bing, it's, it's great for kind of general things. But if you get more specific with it, especially doing academic research, you find that a lot of the results are quite irrelevant. And so you keep clicking in and out of those results. And I thought there'd be a way to instantaneously preview you know, the content behind these results. And it turns out Google has something called Instant Preview, which is an image that they do show um, and allows you to preview the content. But that wasn't too useful because you can't actually get a sense of the, you know, the gist of the piece or the, the details and facts that you would find when reading the text. And so I thought maybe summarization is a way of providing previews of search results, or articles on news aggregation sites. And that's when I thought originally of Sumly and started developing it after my exams. I truly love your, your answer that uh, you just wanted to save time uh, de yeah. developing uh, a new product. That's um, really interesting to learn. But I mean, on the one hand side, I mentioned that earlier when we talked yesterday, on the one hand side, I think giving reasonable and at the same time automated summaries of content and search results some seems to be the most logical thing to do because everybody is complaining about the masses of information and content and even if you read an article you are interested in, sometimes yeah, it's just too long and you don't have the time to do it. So it is 
something very obvious on the one hand side. On the other hand side, it seems to me that this should be, that this must be terribly hard because um, little cute companies like Google and others are working with also some amount of staff and time, I guess, on something very similar. And can you, can you describe a bit more, you already started to do it, what makes your approach different from those approaches? So we use something called machine learning, um, and so basically we hire a linguist to summarize content for us. So different categories of content that the Summly app's likely to come across. So we're currently an iPhone application, and it's our choice to you know, either become a web platform or look to integrate into other services. And so we get the, the human linguist to basically annotate the text and pick out the sentences that they feel should be included in the summary and most relevant. And so the process is called extraction. So we pick three to five sentences from the article or from the web page that we feel are most relevant to include in a summary. And so we get the human to do this, and we take our algorithm and begin comparing the various summaries that that human has made to look for patterns emerging. And we have 15 metrics that we use to pick what sentences we feel are most relevant in the passage. And so these, the, the weights behind these metrics aren't created by a programmer or someone. We are using real data uh, from real summaries created by humans. And so in that case, that's pretty unique uh, to use this form of it's a genetic algorithm, basically, uh, in summarization. And so we have provisional patents for that you know, in the US, UK, Europe. Um, obviously, companies like Google, you could argue, are competition to us. But I don't see that at all. I see that we're kind of a, a layer on top. We, we're complementary to search engines because we're not trying to be our own search engine and indexing results. Uh, we're simply adding that preview layer uh, on top of search engines and, and other sites. So that means, I'm not, I'm not sure if I understood correctly, does it mean that there is a team sitting behind you and also reviewing these kind of things and you are performing <laughs> interviews and asking people to join your group right now? So it was all myself uh, until Horizons Ventures, uh, the private investment arm of Mr. Lee Ka Shing. Um, they got in touch with me and they'd, they'd seen Sumly being written about on, I think, TechCrunch or one of these blogs um, back July last year. And so it'd been kind of a one man show up until that point. And it was great to have people come on and offer me advice and, and help me out. And, and since then, we've got a few people on the team working on the algorithm. In the next couple of months, we're looking to kind of get offices in, in London where I live and um, kind of build the company from there. Thank you very much. Thanks for now. Very impressive. <laughs> very impressive. It's my big pleasure to introduce our next guest, Felix Peterson, who is co-founder and also CEO, CEO of Amen. Amen is following a different uh, approach, and I try to describe your product from my point of view. You may be able to specify a lot better. But in general, you are doing, um, based on one major app, if you will, uh, a kind of voting and discovery and also searching and sharing engine to vote and share the best and worst of everything. Is it correct? Yeah, correct. Um, so you should get a microphone. Thanks. Um, yes, exactly. So um, Eamon is about, uh, it's about opinions. It's about having strong opinions. and. Um, basically, from the beginning of the internet, it's you know opinions have been one of the one of the major drivers, and you know also if you if you visit a bar on a Saturday night, you will hear a lot of opinions being shouted around about music, about sports, um, and I think we're exactly coming sort of from the from the other side that there is is it is very hard to infer uh, sentiment in to understand what you know all these status status updates mean. If you look at Twitter and Facebook, um, there is a lot of opinion there, but it's very hard to quantify it and say, well, now according to my friends, what really is the best TV show at the moment, or you know, what is the best uh, vice beer, or what is you know the best, the best app right now, the best the app right one. now, exactly. So um, what we basically do, um, maybe I don't know, maybe you can zoom in on this. Can we try this out? Uh, I know, forget it. Um, so. So you post about um, um, a, a person, uh, a place, or a thing. So you could um, basically you post in a, um, in, in a in a certain structure. So you say something like um, Matt Damon is the worst actor ever, or Matt Damon is the best actor with just one facial expression. And then um, your friends basically follow you and they see the opinions that uh, that you've been stating. And then they have two options: um, Amen, hence the name. So it's you know it's a really strong affirmation basically, 
or and that's kind of you know basically you could say we we've invented the the unlike button you can you can say uh, hell no um, but you you can't just say boo basically when you say hell no within the same structure then you have to say who you think is the best actor which is one facial expression and then a bunch of people aim at me and say Matt Damon other people say Nicolas Cage and then in the end um, of course something of a hit list emerges because of that structured approach it's still very easy and fun to post it um, but it's very easy to um, to extract data because basically every you know every object in that sentence can be clicked on you can click on the best the best TV show at the moment but you can also click on Game of Thrones or, or Breaking Bad and then see what other people have been said, saying about it so it's kind of like the cover of the you know the back of a book where um, you get all the quotes about you know what people have been saying about this um, this book and the great thing is that um, as an individual opinion might actually be very um, might actually be very very simple and, and people have been saying well you know you cannot just describe a person with, with one sentence or a product or you know it's not enough but it's like a mosaic when you know a single individual stone is a very binary opinion but when you start putting them on top of each other you can you can create very photorealistic you know uh, infinitely complex um, 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 uh, drawings and so that's kind of that's kind of what Amen is. It's a very simple mechanism, but out of it evolves more and emerges more um, than, than just a simple opinion. And um, what's your, if if I may interrupt sure. you, what, what's your what's your distribution strategy right now? You are available for iPhone, right? So, uh, what's your plan rolling out to a broader audience? Is is Android something sitting sitting in your uh, schedule already, or? Sure. I mean, I, I'm sure we come back to this in more depth later, but basically we do have a website. So I think in contrast to maybe some other things, you know, there is apps like, you know, Instagram or, or, or Foursquare where it is just about mobile. And of course, mobile for us plays a huge role because when, you know, when, when do you have the, the urge to post an opinion? It's usually when you're on you're on the couch and you're actually watching that movie, or when you're in you know when you're in a, um, in, 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 a, in a restaurant and you just had an amazing meal and you want to say this this must be the best place for uh, tacos in, in Munich. It's probably not a good city for tacos, but anyway, um, tacos in San Francisco and Huxen in Munich, whatever. But um, but but. Um, um, that's why mobile does play a big role, and it was our. It looks kind of interesting. We started with mobile, and I thought I think it also helped us um, focus the product very much. We then decided, no, we do need a website because basically, when you sit in front of your computer at the office and you want to react to opinions, because there's really two different ways of using AIM, and one is one is you post a new opinion, and the other is you you explore and use it as a resource and say, well, I'm going to Barcelona now. What actually is the best of the best in Barcelona? And also, you might just want to react to your friend's opinion and say, Amen or or hell no. So we do have a website but I feel it helped us tremendously that we started with the mobile and had a very focused sleek product um, and then just reflected that on the website um, other than the other way around where sometimes you know you tend to, to, to do things to bloat things up because you know it's um, you have all these possibilities in the browser that you might not have um, you, you know with less restrictions but it was good for us to start with mobile Android yes down the road but I believe that um, if you can't make it work and if you can't gain traction and you can't sell the concept on one platform, it just slows you down to, to do more, right? I mean, what's the point of us? Um, like, um, we are, we're going to introduce new things. Like, today, actually, I'm happy to announce that we're, um, we're adding pictures um, so that you can say, this is the best sunset ever. Um, that kind of new um, feature if you want to do that on two, three platforms, you know, one of them always has to wait. You, you know, you actually have to coordinate the rollout much more. It's kind of like language versions. If you do 17 languages, it does slow you down. So I think as as long as we, as long as we, you know, um, um, haven't, as long as we're still evolving the product so fast and we don't have uh, reached a certain level of penetration in uh, in the iPhone market, there's no reason for us to to do a different platform. You just have to pick one. You could it could be Android. We could have done Android, but we've picked iPhone, and and you know basically, I think that's what we um, what we're going to be doing for the next couple of months at least exclusively. Mentioning uh, the picture and the image of the sunsets already helps me to build the perfect bridge to our to our next guest because um, Shiloh Shiv Sulman joined us from India from Bangalore. Welcome in Munich, and. Um, one of your key beliefs is that technology has to move away from just being functional and usable to really being emotional. And you also mentioned, and one of your key beliefs is that right now, the ways uh, people like me and maybe many others of you as well, how we tell stories on the iPad and other devices to the audience 
it's not the right way to do it. Yeah, when I heard that first, I thought, hey, this is what everybody is pretending to do. But then I saw your demo and I was very impressed. So please tell us and please describe what is your key idea and how do you get right into the hearts of people with your product? Um, so when I was a little girl, my grandfather gave me this little silver pocket watch. And this piece of 50-year-old technology became the most magical, gilded gateway into a world full of time travelers and, and pirates and shipwrecks and all sorts of things. And somehow, um, our technology doesn't do that anymore. I feel like, like we're, we're so caught up on how usable things are and how functional things are that we sometimes forget that wonder um, that we experience as children. I started illustrating books for children when I was 16 years old, your age. And, um, uh, and I've illust illustrated about eight since. And at some point, I decided I actually found myself becoming a little bit of a technophobe. I was so afraid that I would lose the ability to actually enjoy that sunset without having a camera on me and tweeting it to my friends. Um, but I decided actually to jump into it and get over it, um, because technology can be magical. Um, so I'm just going to show you Koya. It was launched at the Inc. conference this year, and I've been working together with some of my best friends on it. Um, so it says, place your fingers upon each light. Oops, is the sound on? Can you just check that out? Sorry, the sound cable. All right. It's soft, yeah. All right, so it says, place your fingers upon each light. And so when I place my fingers, the iPad reads my hand and opens up Koya. essentially a series of interactive narratives for children that uses technology and new media like the iPad and augmented reality to really bring alive the magic and fantasy in a fantasy story for kids. Um, it says this box belongs to, and so when I type my name in, I become one of the characters in the book. And at different points in the narrative, these letters drop down and uh, figures out where I am. So the book actually knows where you are at different points in the narrative. So now when I say I wanted to use the iPad to create magic, I don't mean like goblins and uh, fairies and wizards. I mean this kind of childhood magic, like this idea of fireflies inside a jar was really magical to me as a kid. And so over here, when you, it says tilt me, and so then when I tilt my screen, I let these fireflies out. And they, they then illuminate the way through the rest of the book. Another idea that I had as a child was, was that an entire universe could be contained within a single marble, with that little spiral thing in the middle. And so over here, we've actually created a device within the device that reads these marble worlds and uh, opens up the map of that world. And so this map actually then becomes your chapter navigation as well. And you can make your way from one chapter to the next using this device. Um, another thing that's actually quite important to me as well is using this global market to bring out Indian mythology and Indian archetypes. Uh, when I was young, I grew up reading Enid Blyton and Harry Potter, and so I knew all about scones and tea and uh, picnics and that kind of thing. But I think now with the global market, we can actually make this exchange mutual. And that gets really interesting for me. So, so can, you, can you let us know a bit more around what kind of stage are we in right now? Is this something that is available right now? It's and available you sell right it now. inside and outside of India? And, um, yeah, it's available it? everywhere. You can download it on your iPads right now, if you like. Um, and do, 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 can you share some, can you share some information? information with us on around how it does in India and how it is going outside? Um, well, it, was actually, it actually was released three days ago. Three days ago. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is we'll soon find maybe out. very <laughs> early stage, and I guess yeah. after this presentation it um, may be a lot of out of India sales. <laughs> um, if I may interrupt you for yeah. a second, we have yeah. time later to, to, to go on uh, stepping more into detail, but I would really love to take the opportunity because we have so many experts here sitting on the stage around discussing what are I mean, we already, you all already realized um, very successful 
uh, solutions for very different, um, for very different uh, opportunities. When we think about 2015, what do you think, what will be different at that point of time? Where do the moves go? I mean, you already realized the product yeah, where everybody can simply buy, uh, simply build and manage its own app. You are doing the, the summarization stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But what will be different? Where are, where are the big trends today? And it can be an open discussion on this stage, so no particular order. Um, well, so I think trying to project at least mobile three years out is, is basically impossible. It's like decades out in any other industry. Um, you know, I think the trend, well, there's some basic trends that we know, uh, but probably by the end of this year, more traffic, uh, traffic will be more common coming from a mobile device, a smartphone, than from a desktop or a laptop computer to any given website in the world. So clearly the, the trend is mobile is very important. Um, I think commerce on mobile still hasn't really been solved. I think it's really kind of painful to try to buy a t-shirt or shoes or some physical product. Um, there's a lot of companies working on that. Um, I think Android is, uh, is definitely going to be the, the biggest, they're already the biggest smartphone OS in the world and um, I don't see that stopping just because it's the, the price is right and there's so many manufacturers. Um, I, I think I, I really uh, I, I really love your app, and I think that um, the bar is keeps getting higher and higher, which is awesome for for user experiences on mobile, not just uh, functional experiences, but doing something that really changes your life. Um, I, I'm just curious, how many people in the room have used an application called Path? Okay, um, and how many of you that are using Path signed up in the last 90 days? So that's almost everyone that raised their hand. And um, that application, for example, um, I didn't think anything could really uh, replace Facebook in my life, but actually I'm visiting Path 10 times more than I'm visiting Facebook, and I don't know if everyone's sharing that experience. But stuff like that, that actually changes and improves your life because of a piece of technology, I think is, is fantastic. Nick, when you are 19 years old, how will the <laughs> app market look like? Well, I mean, as you know, I don't know either, but I'm a bit fearful of kind of the, the saturation of the app store market. Uh, when I when I started out three years ago, which is, I was like 12, uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean the, the apps I was making weren't great, but I was able to get a lot of downloads and you know, I'd make free apps um, and you could get quite high in the rankings. And you know, in July, August 2008, there were only 1,000, 2,000 apps on the store. And so discoverability was quite easy. Uh, you know, now there's already 500,000 apps on the App Store, and I think Android's catching up as well. And so even with our experience with Samli, this is probably the hardest launch I've had so far in trying to get users, despite having investors behind me and having you know people um, asking me for you know press options and, and everything like that. I still found it really hard to gain new users because you're competing with you know apps of the level of Path and Instagram and, and, and services as well that are now in the industry. They're quite well known and consolidated themselves over the last year, two years. And so in trying to break into the App Store market, I mean, if you look at the top 25 free apps in the App Store, I mean, each one must have you know, 10 million plus users, and it's extremely hard. I mean, past the, kind of the most recent one to have broken into that top 25. And so I think there's going to be a change in the way users discover um, apps. And, and you know, the, I know there's services like Chomp that already make that quite uh, a lot easier uh, to do so, but I think it's going to be harder to garner a lot of downloads just by getting a good rank or by getting featured. I mean, we were app of the week in some of the European countries, which is great um, uh, from Apple uh, for Sumly, but you can even see after that app of the week uh, promotion stops, you can see kind of the spike in downloads begins to decrease. And so I think even getting featured so prominently on the App Store now isn't enough to maintain the top 25 rank in that app store and so discoverability may change in the next couple of years and obviously there's going to be a lot more great apps coming to, out. To, um, to um, second this, um, I mean I, I actually hope, um, I actually think this whole app economy is bullshit um, and like you know I, I actually I hope that in the next couple of years, I'm pretty sure it will happen, um, we'll take a little bit back on the mobile what made you know uh, web and the browser uh, great on the desktop, right? Because I think it makes no sense whatsoever to take content that you would have on a website that is just, 
you know, um, stuff like a, uh, like a newspaper article, package that in an app, basically for the sole reason that the App Store will help you distribute, right? There's no reason to do it. It's actually stupid. It reminds me of the multimedia CD-ROMs, you know, and all the great <laughs> stuff that comes with the web, like being able to deep link and share, and what actually made the social web great. We're taking that away a little bit. And I mean, it's kind of to the point that, that you might have made earlier, Mike, I mean, um, yes, apps for 3D games, for sure, you know, I mean, if you want to do a great racing game, if you want that last bit of fidelity, then you need to go native, and you know, that's clear. But you know, I, I've, n I've no idea why, why, um, why um, like, a, like a Spiegel online app makes, makes a lot of sense, to be honest. I, I actually hope that web apps will, you know, and, and I think that's where it's going. And it just needs a big player like Facebook who basically, you know, will say like, well, screw you, Apple, you know, we're just gonna, if you don't have Facebook in your app store, then you have a problem, so we're just gonna do HTML5 app. My, my point, Hello? Uh, my point was actually, my point was that you couldn't use our platform to do that. I do think, I, I agree in principle with what you're saying that uh, we shouldn't need to have apps because the web should just be able to do it. But Google Docs have been around for 10 years and people still use Word and PowerPoint and stuff like that. I think that um, until the, the, it's all about user experience, that's it. And actually for finding new apps, it's all about user experience. Yeah. Because I just saw your demo, I'm probably gonna show 10 other people because <laughs> I really like it and same with Path. And, yeah. and so um, actually I'm, I'm not sure discoverability is that huge of an issue because I think good old fashioned, I tell my friends what I like works with good apps. Sure. With native apps, um, the key advantage is a better, much better user experience and a few other nuances like the, the demo with Push that I showed. Um, I don't see that changing. I, I get asked a lot, when are web apps gonna overtake mobile apps? And I'm not even sure that's a fair comparison. Every website should have a mobile component. It should be mobile friendly. That's just baseline these days. Um, but there, there does need to be a reason to build an app, not just to wrap your website and call it an app, but to actually provide um, value in that user experience. But yeah. I, I, I still see a lot of value in having that increased user experience. No, no, no I agree. You, you could have never done what you did on, exactly. on the web. Exactly. I think also uh, one of the big sort of values with, with Koya is um, we're trying to find the links between magic, the earth, and technology. Um, so the last 10 years, kids have been glued to PCs, right, playing all sorts of games. But now kids can actually get outside their house into natural immersive spaces with using their technology. So one of the interactions in the book, for example, is that you're sent off on this quest where you need to go outside and collect different natural objects from around your, your area. And then you can put them up online. So a child in India says, oh, I saw a peacock, and the child in, in London puts up a picture of a fox, um, and so on and so forth. And then they can actually trade these photographs as well. And, and also, just in terms of like seeing how this moves forward, since Koya is a series, we, we plan on having interactions where, for example, at one point, your screen is, is covered with leaves. And so you need to make the sound of wind, like and the leaves blow away. Or you need to say a, a specific word, like grow, and a tree grows over your, your screen. Uh, we want to have augmented reality in there, so you go outside to your garden and you can see the magical creatures that inhabit your garden. So these kind of things are only possible on, on mobile devices, so I think it's quite interesting as well. I already, do, do I, I, I already understand that. Just, just a second, I already understand and can imagine how the magic uh, is uh, 2015 looking yeah. like. From what I understood from you, Felix, is that you said that there are dedicated things where the desktop experience has and will improve over the next over the next years can you give examples of where you think that there that there that the web desktop experience needs to be improved to to, to serve some similar items well i mean i think it's I, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm the biggest fan of mobile, but I think we need to be smart about what is actually the character of mobile versus, versus desktop. And I think with the things you just mentioned, uh, sensors, that's kind of what makes it really interesting. That's the kind of thing, taking sort of slices out of reality or yeah. augmented reality, I think that's, that's where, where, where it's really interesting and where, where it makes sense. Packaging content in an app to read something, to me, is okay. It's a starting point. You know, it's like a bookmark that that little, you know, the little icon on your on your on your grid. But I don't think that's what's revolutionary about it. And when you know, there's all this talk about the app economy. And when you talk to publishers, for example, I, I, I think they're 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 getting it wrong. To be honest, like they're they're not, you know, they're not actually emphasizing on what is special on mobile, but just basically repackaging stuff. I mean, I found it interesting. There's this shift uh, to focus a lot on user interface. And graphics are now so important. I mean, your app icon, 
Uh, if you have a great app icon, you're going to have so many more people who either see it in search or see it in the featured list who are likely to click on it. And equally, I'm finding the reason why I keep coming back to Path a lot is just because the user interface is so awesome that I'll open it just to play around with the little animations. And I find that a lot of the other iPhone apps that I use, I mean, I use Flipboard, for example, for news, uh, because it's, it's, it's so nicely... Um, integrate it in terms of the user experience, mm. but equally it's the little graphical almost extras that come with these kinds of apps that keep drawing you back to them. And so I think there's a shift in, in apps. It's not just about the functionality now, but in order to differentiate yourself, because there's probably 150 different newsreader apps, but the reason why Flipboard and Pulse and Zeit, these, these specific apps have such high ranking is because they have those little extras. And I think, you know, these are all free apps. And I think users are almost becoming more selfish in what they expect from an iPhone app. And you see this polarization in the reviews. You either get these five-star reviews, I love this, I shared it with all my mates, or you get these one-star reviews, this is terrible. Because I think people are becoming more impatient when downloading apps because there's so much choice. There are over 500,000 apps. And so it's getting harder and harder now um, when you're pushing out apps. You have to be so much more careful and do your due diligence in the graphics and equally making sure there aren't any crashes because people will only give it one shot. And if it doesn't work, you know, they'll disregard it and move on. Ladies and gentlemen, you have four experts here on stage talking a bit that built their own um, businesses uh, very successfully. And we have 10 minutes, roughly 10 minutes left for questions. The gentleman over there, please. Just a second, you'll get a microphone. Uh, I'm just interested in what you think of the, uh, the retail experience in sh searching for and shopping for apps. This is just pure personal observation, but I find the Apple App Store just terrible as a, as a retail experience. <laughs> very difficult to find things, very difficult to qualify them. And when I, and I'm saying this just based on lots of recent experience looking for various things and scuba diving and other things. So as companies, small entrepreneurs who depend on what is re a relative monopoly in the retail side? What do you think of the retail experience and how would you attempt to improve it or diversify it? I actually think the iTunes experience is, is quite good personally, but a big problem is copycat apps. Uh, we do a lot of apps for a lot of big brand names and I don't know, I'll throw one out, uh, Katy Perry. And if you go in uh, right now, Katy Perry's official app that she put out is not number one. It's a fan app or it's somebody trying to make a buck off of her name or her image. So I, I think that is a, a big problem, copycats, and every good idea has copycats, but um, I don't know. I don't have any other opinions about the retail experience. I mean, from, from a um, distribution standpoint, I mean, the, the, it's, it's amazing, actually, to once you know, you're in the app store, you realize how, how little you can do um, to, um, to actually do something. You, 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 you know, for a while, you, you think there must be a way um, of promoting this, and of course, in the in the Android world, you know, with third-party app store, that's a little different. But in that closed Apple world, it's 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 really kind of amazing. Like, you, just a couple of tactics, like have a good relationship with the with the guy who runs the promotions, or you know, maybe um, get putting in a feature early that Apple just released. You know, if you're the first to use push notifications, of course, impeccable design, like something super polished, super great, that will get you so far, but only so far. And you know, what's if you do uh, something something like Aim and where People don't know that they're looking for this, right? So it's not a utility where someone goes in and says, I want the calculator app, or someone goes in and says, I want the Coca-Cola app because that brand is already well known. Um, this, the App Store really isn't that, that massive of a distribution machine. Of course, once you get into the promotions, it's huge. But basically, the discovery happens through uh, sharing and you know, people learning about the app on Facebook. Um, and then eventually um, landing, you know, landing on in, in their browser on the page and see that oh, there's already a, there's also an app. So I think you know they need to get much better around sort of social discovery that you know you kind of find interesting things that you didn't know you wanted or you didn't know what you would search for to find them. I mean, yeah, I think uh, for authors and illustrators as well, the app still becomes quite interesting because. Um, as an illustrator, I've always had a problem where a giant publishing house would always own my work, you know, but now I actually own my, my book. Um, and so, so the, the giant publisher, the distributor, all of these other players in the game kind of disappear. So that's why. Then now it's Apple. Except Apple, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Sir. 
Hey, I've got a quick question just looking at Felix uh, up there with uh, such a talented uh, group of young people. It, first question, Felix, you starting to feel like an old man in this, you know, kind of uh, marketplace, you know, <laughs> kind of thing? Um, hope that Amen really takes off uh, uh, in places you already have a good track record with that. And secondly, it's, it seems to me it's kind of like the, uh, the music, or not the music video, the video game industry when it first started out. You know, you first had Atari and stuff like this, some of the bigger guys, but then once it kind of opened up, a lot of these smaller, you know, teenagers literally out of uh, England started to take over and, you know, just build out on different devices and stuff. Is it the same thing? Are we seeing the same thing with, uh, with app development, you think? I mean, judging from my experience, I think so. I mean, there are obviously, I, there are a lot of, there are a lot of actually, uh, if you look out there on the forums and things, there are a lot of like 13 year old, 14 year old iPhone app developers. I mean, obviously it's hard to get noticed because I think, you know, for people like 13 year olds, 14 year olds, as I was, you just have to keep working your skills until you get to a level where you can basically take something in your head and see the true manifestation of it as you want. And so obviously, as I was saying earlier, there's this benchmark for quality now. And so just because you're a kid doesn't mean you're gonna get noticed because of your story or anything. You really do need to have a fundamental either technology or concept behind you that really can turn into a business. And so I think there's gonna be this democratization of content creation in apps where there are going to be more and more teenagers literally competing with the likes of Google and Path and other well-consolidated apps on the App Store uh, simply because the way Apple have set it up, you can just submit an app to the App Store, there's a review process, but as long as the app you know, doesn't crash and it's not buggy, you can, you're out there. And obviously the App Store prov provides a great platform for, for discovering apps. And so you don't necessarily need a lot of press contacts or know people in the industry. If it's a good app, through word of mouth, through social sharing, you can get noticed. I think that point is uh, to tech startups in general, which is if you're not starting by 22 and funded by 23 and able to retire by 24 or 25, then you fail. <laughs> and I think um, you know, we all feel that pressure, and that's actually what, probably what motivates us as well. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you uh, in the audience.